Just days after a Marine Corps F-35B went missing over South Carolina last month, a government watchdog released a scathing report on the stealth fighters' readiness rates across the force. According to the Government Accountability Office, only around half of America's F-35s are actually ready for a fight. Now there's no other way to look at it, that's bad news. But how bad is it really? Let's add some context to these numbers. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. If you read the comments under my videos or written work, which I always try to do, it's not all that uncommon for those who disagree with me to call me a shill for the military-industrial complex, or a propagandist for the U.S. military. Because my analysis into the advanced technologies being fielded by the U.S. defense apparatus often comes off as a bit one-sided. After all, just about every developed nation in the world is actively developing new military and weapons technologies. But the truth is, from my perspective, there's very good reason to place a great deal of emphasis on U.S. defense programs, and that's simply that the United States invests more money into research and development every year than any other nation on the planet. After all, until just recently, America's yearly black budget alone was about on par with Russia's entire defense expenditure. That means America spends about the same amount of money on covert and classified research, development, and operations than Russia usually spent on its entire military apparatus. The fact of the matter is, when it comes to fielding a number of advanced defense technologies, especially in large volume, the United States is objectively often in a class of its own. Now, that's not to say that I'm completely free of bias. Of course, I served in the United States Marine Corps for just about seven years before I was medically retired, and I still interact with U.S. service members on a day-to-day -day basis. And while some may see my affiliation with the U.S. military and my social circle including a number of service members as a shortcoming for my work, which to be clear is totally fine, that's your prerogative, but from my vantage point, I see it as a strength because it gives me the opportunity to gain insight and perspective into what's really going on in the U.S. military today, free of the media spin that's so often used to try to scare or enrage you into clicking, sharing, or commenting. And I mention all this because those fear and outrage tactics are used so commonly in media discussions about everyone's favorite aircraft, the F-35. Now, we've discussed the F-35 a lot of times on this channel, and by now you guys know my position. The F-35 is, hands down, the most technologically advanced and broadly capable tactical aircraft ever to fly. But that does not excuse the fact that its research and development process, as well as its acquisition cycle, have been fundamentally broken. And as a result, this aircraft ended up immensely expensive, not just to develop or to purchase, but also to maintain or operate. But more often than not, I see discussions about these very real problems on both news media and social media framed hyperbolically and without any external context that might help someone actually grasp how bad or not so bad the situation may be. And that happened once again over these past few weeks after a government accountability office report came out highlighting just how bad F-35 readiness rates really are. According to their findings, just 55% of America's 400-plus F-35s are mission-capable at any given time. Now, that figure falls well short of the Pentagon's goals and highlights a litany of issues within both the Defense Department and within Lockheed Martin's F-35 support infrastructure. But, and by now you guys know there is always a but, because reality is nuanced, it's important for us to consider the greater context, not just of the F-35 program, but of our own basis for comparison. Because while this report does definitely bring up some real problems, to date, there is no stealth fighter program on the planet that we can use as that basis for comparison. There's no ifs about it. Lockheed Martin's money-sucking F-35 is just in a league of its own, and as a result, it has no contemporaries to compare to. 
Now, I do understand that that may sound like bias here. After all, in a world with F-22 Raptors and Chengdu J-20s and maybe even the Su-57, there are certainly fifth-generation fighters that we can compare in a one-to-one -one way. But this honestly has less to do with the fact that the F-35 genuinely can do things that none of these other fighters are capable of. It really has to do with production volume. Because to date, there are more F-35s in the world than all other stealth aircraft ever built by any nation combined. And if you're not actually aware of that, when you see news stories about the F-35 program break, it can really skew your perspective. But to be clear, this is not a defense of the F-35's low readiness rates, nor is it a defense of the Pentagon's approach to contract management or even of Lockheed Martin's profit mongering. Instead, we should see this as essential context that we can use in our efforts to assess the real differences between problems that were created by Lockheed Martin and the Pentagon's contract policy and program choices and problems that may just be inherent to operating large fleets of data-fusing stealth fighters in our current technological era. To put it another way, if we're going to fix these readiness-related issues, we first have to assess their actual causes and determine whether or not they can be attributed to mismanagement or to the current state of technology. Problems created by mismanaged contracts or poorly distributed resources could be fairly easy to resolve. I mean, easy as a relative term in the jungle of red tape that is federal contracting bureaucracy. Now, these problems do seem to be many, and the biggest hurdles between identifying and solving them often seems to come in the form of Lockheed Martin protecting its profit share. Technological hurdles, on the other hand, might actually require the advent of new technologies, material sciences, or maintenance methodologies that themselves might even require physical changes to support infrastructure or even the fighter's design. Resolving these kinds of issues comes with all the same red tape as the others, and then some. But despite the internet's affinity for just chalking these problems up to things like capitalism or how the government works, the hard truth of the matter is operating a large number of stealth fighters might actually just be harder and more expensive than operating the large fleets of non-stealth fighters that we're used to. Now, I know that may seem like a common sense conclusion to draw, but our habit of comparing things like readiness rates to historical precedent suggests that we're just not willing to embrace that reality. Common sense just isn't always all that common. To take this back out of the logistical realm, it's not all that different from how I and many other analysts have explained that the F-35 just doesn't fight like the powerhouse fighters of yesteryear. And as a result, just comparing its thrust to weight ratio or top speed or max altitude to hot rods like the F-15 really does a flying stealth supercomputer like the F-35 a serious disservice. It's like comparing a heavyweight UFC fighter to a sniper. Sure, they both fight people, but their intended use cases and the way in which they go about their business are so different that using a standard criteria to judge both just doesn't produce a very useful result. To paraphrase Albert Einstein, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it'll live its whole life believing that it's stupid. So if we can wrap our heads around the idea that the F-35 fights in a different way than aircraft like the F-15 or even the F-16, maybe we can also wrap our heads around the idea that sustainment practices and standards will also almost certainly be different. But as we explore these possibilities, we also have to avoid falling into the trap of robbing complex topics of their nuance. Because the idea that F-35 readiness rates may be suffering to some extent because of the innate challenges of fielding these advanced aircraft in large volume, and the idea that readiness rates may also be suffering due to poor contract management or even contractor budget abuse are not mutually exclusive. In fact, from my perspective, it seems all but certain that it's a combination of those factors. So let's take a closer look at these numbers. According to that report from the Government Accountability Office, or the GAO, more than 10,000 F-35 parts were piled up waiting for repairs in March of this year. And in simple terms, that 55% readiness rates means that only 55 out of every 100 F-35s in America's possession were ready to fly their respective missions at any given time. 
Now, this falls way short of the Pentagon's stated goal of a 90% readiness rate for the conventional runway Queen F-35A and an 85% readiness rate for its more complex and abuse-absorbing sisters, the short takeoff vertical landing F-35B and the carrier-capable F-35C. Now, this is bad news, but it shouldn't come as a surprise. F-35 readiness rates have never come anywhere near that 85 to 90 percent goal. In fact, in recent years, their readiness rates have ranged from as low as 54 percent to a high of 65. The real story about this report isn't that F-35 readiness has plummeted, but rather that it hasn't really improved over time. Now, according to the GAO, the primary culprits here are a failure to prioritize funding for F-35 repair depots, too heavy a reliance on contractors like Lockheed Martin, and a lack of necessary technical data in the Pentagon's hands. But exacerbating these issues is the topic of concurrent production, which before I called the dirtiest two words in aircraft acquisitions. That's what we call the decision to start building F-35s before testing was complete. That single decision ballooned the cost of this program and created countless issues in procurement, and it's now evident that it's still creating issues for sustainment. Because as a result of changes being made to the aircraft's design after low-rate production began, today's F-35s are less like three variants of one aircraft and more like 14 different aircraft that just share a lot of parts in common. And that's not my conclusion. That's the GAOs. Let's dive a bit deeper into each of those issues. One of the biggest culprits, according to the GAO, is a significant and foreseeable lack of adequate depot capacity for repairs. In fact, this lack of depot capacity may be the biggest problem in the F-35's repair delays. Anytime an aircraft or system requires more comprehensive maintenance or repairs than could be done on the flight line or in a unit's facilities, that aircraft or component is sent off to a depot for more in-depth service. Now, according to the GAO, America's depot facilities won't be fully operational until 2027 or later, meaning things aren't getting better anytime soon. The average repair time for systems sent off to repair depots in October 2017 was around 172 days, but things have improved since then, reaching 141 days by February of this year. But that's about 81 days longer than the Pentagon's top-line goal of 60 days and 51 days longer than their bottom-line goal of 90. This creates other problems, too. Because depot facilities are so strained, 73% of systems being sent out for repairs are instead being sent back to Lockheed Martin or subsidiary contractors, which drives up costs and timelines because the contractors often cost more to do the same job and take even longer to do it. Now, the reason why I say this is almost certainly the single biggest problem here is because according to the GAO's findings, just having the F-35's repair depot infrastructure stood up properly would improve readiness rates by 10%. In other words, bringing F-35 readiness rates from 55% to 65% could be as simple as just getting these repair depots up and running. Now, 65% is, admittedly, way short of that 85-90% to 90 goal, but realistically speaking, it would only be 5% shy of the 70% mark at which the F-16 and F-15 tend to hover around. In other words, at that point, there would only be a 5% or so difference between the fourth generation F-15 and F-16 and the F-35, which requires significant maintenance on things like its radar absorbent skin and other systems these fourth generation jets don't even have. All right, depots down. Now let's talk about how Lockheed Martin and its subcontractors are prioritizing their profit share and disputes between themselves over sharing data with the DoD that they actually need. Because according to the GAO, LM and its subcontractors have demonstrated a total unwillingness to share what they call proprietary data with depot level and lower level maintainers. In other words, uniformed service members maintaining and repairing these aircraft. Now, to be clear, the GAO did not conclude that these contractors were not sharing this data in order to prevent the DOD from absorbing jobs that would otherwise be contracted to them. That's my own assessment based on the context, and to be clear with you, that could be wrong. 
And to that very counterpoint, at least in some instances, it's got less to do with profit chasing and more to do with a lack of trust between subcontractors and the prime contractor, Lockheed Martin. I'm going to quote this report here, but as I do, keep in mind that when I say prime contractor, I mean Lockheed Martin. DOD officials told us that the subcontractor is hesitant to share its technical data because of the oversight the prime contractor has over the program and not wanting the technical data to end up in the prime contractor's control. Now, this problem extends beyond the physical realm and into the software as well. The F-35 flies with over 8 million individual lines of code running its onboard systems, and all of that code was written by contractors, and all of it is currently managed or repaired by the same, despite the Pentagon's ongoing efforts to secure this source code for going on five years now. And if that sounds crazy, it should because it is. And the Air Force is hoping to make sure this never happens again as they develop their next stealth fighter, the NGAD or Next Generation Air Dominance Fighter, by forcing its contractors to work within its system right from the start. The Air Force has no intentions of asking anybody for the source code. They're just going to keep it in their house so they never have to. But I do want to be clear that there are two sides to this issue, because while I'm inclined to say that Lockheed Martin should obviously provide the source code to the DoD, there's another position that says all of this is the DoD's fault in the first place. And believe it or not, one of the biggest champions of that position was the guy in charge of the F-35 program office back in 2016 when this debate was already underway. When questioned about this, he explained that suppliers fight fiercely to shield their trade secrets for good reason and this should have been addressed by including stipulations for intellectual property in the contracts that were drawn up all the way back in the 90s. But since they weren't, we're still working on finding a resolution to this problem. All right, we've covered the lack of depot repair facilities and the pitfalls of corporate capitalism. Now let's talk about the lack of spare parts. Because even if you have the technical capability and the facilities you need to make a repair, you can't do it without the parts that you need. Now the spare parts shortage is actually once again exacerbated by the lack of depot repair facilities because a lot of units have turned to just ordering new parts because they know getting their parts repaired would take too long. And that adds a bunch of cost and strain on the production line, which can have a snowball effect across the fleet. Now, I'd imagine this all paints a pretty grim picture of the F-35 program in a lot of your eyes, but the truth is, these sorts of problems and even these low readiness rates are not particularly unique to the F-35 or the American military industrial complex. In fact, you'll really find these kinds of issues in just about every defense acquisition around the planet, at least in nations without totalitarian governments that control every aspect of production and will just cut your hand off for the source code. And that brings us back to my original point, that context matters. Because as we've already discussed, if the DOD resolves just the repair depot capacity issue, which they already have a plan for by 2027, well, then F-35 readiness rates will be just shy of fourth generation figures for aircraft that are significantly easier to maintain. But the truth is, even if we could magically resolve all the issues we just discussed overnight, we could still find that that 85 to 90% readiness rate goal just isn't financially viable with our current state of technology. And right now, there is not a single stealth fighter program on the planet that we could compare the F-35 to to help us decide if solutions to these problems are coming too slowly or right on time. The F-35 program today is unequivocally in uncharted territory, so comparing its readiness rates to fighters like the F-16 that have been around for more than 40 years is sort of like comparing the Lewis and Clark expedition to a road trip cross-country. It always just takes longer and costs a bit more to do something the first time. The truth is, our habit of comparing these aircraft in a singular fashion, as though they're going to go duke it out in the sky in one-on-one -on -one dogfights between the best single stealth fighters from each nation, tends to make us lose sight of just how successful the F-35 program has been, not just compared to other fifth-generation fighters, but even most fourth-generation fighters as well. In fact, the F-35 is the only fifth-generation fighter to make it onto the list of top 10 most widely operated fighters in the world today. There are already more F-35s out there than there ever were A-10s, F-14s, or Super Hornets. 
More nations operate the F-35 than have ever operated the F-15, the Su-27, or the Eurofighter Typhoon, just to name a few. And if you narrow these comparisons down to just fifth-generation fighters, they become even more stark in the F-35's favor. The F-22 Raptor had its production run cut short at just 186 fighters built. Current estimates for China's Chengdu J-20 sit at somewhere between 200 and 250 airframes, but it wasn't until just a few months ago that the first rumors began to swirl about a J-20 flying with its intended fifth-generation engine, the WS-15. Of course, Russia's Su-57 also isn't operating a fifth-generation engine, but considering there's only between 7 and 10 serial production aircraft in the world, the Su-57's entire existence could fall within the DoD budget's margin for error. There are more different countries with the F-35 already in service than there are actual Su-57s in service. And it's further important to understand that neither China nor Russia actually publish the readiness rates for any of their military aircraft, meaning that even if there were enough of these jets to compare readiness rates to, there would be no data to compare. If you ask me, the F-35's fleet-wide readiness rate of 55% is indeed low, but not based on any comparison to any other aircraft program out there, because the F-35 program does not have a peer. Likewise, we really can't compare its readiness rate to that 85-90% to goal the DoD laid out that's been cited in the media so frequently lately, because that goal wasn't based on any real data, it was just made up. If you look at actual mission-capable rates across the entire Air Force, not just for fighters, but aircraft of all kinds, the average readiness rate in 2020 was 72.7%. The average rate in 2021? was 71.5. I mean, a 90% readiness rate is 20% better than we've been able to muster in cargo aircraft, like the C-130H. No, the F-35's 55% readiness rate is low just compared to where it could be once we work out all the issues with sustainment. But the fact of the matter is, even with a 55% readiness rate, the United States has more stealth fighters mission ready on the flight line right now than any other nation on the planet. We need to be able to highlight problems and work toward progress without presenting everything as a catastrophe. And with that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.